has been, as we all know, a very difficult and uh, I would say, um, you know, it's been a difficult year, but it's also been a year of, of finding ways to be flexible and, you know, still do the things that we have been doing for some sense of normalcy. And I think us being able to run Tessa has been a way to kind of keep things quote unquote normal for this year, even though it has been adjusted in a big way from what we normally run. Um, and I want to thank all of the parents and the students. The students have been so resilient and, um, you know, adaptable and flexible with this format and they've still gotten really great projects out of this which has been you know a really nice outcome of what we weren't sure how it was going to work with the way that we had structured things um, and also the parents because we had some days with heat waves where they had to pick up their students by 12 o'clock and i know a lot of you work um, and the, the ride sharing and, and moving around you know the schedule based on the weather it was so hot here for at least a week week and a half um, that made for really difficult work outside. Um, you know, not having access to the buildings was a bit of a challenge, but everybody's risen to that. And I've, I've been really proud to be a part of this program this year. Um, I think that we've done, you know, our best as instructors to still give the students something that they can take with them into their science research projects, you know, moving forward. So um, Mike, do you want to add anything to that or? Um, not not much. I think Danielle said it really well. Um, the, the students were amazing this year and just being very adaptable and kind of rolling with it. Um, but given all of that, I really think it's, in my time at Tusk, it's been some of the best projects that I've seen. So I've been really happy with that. So given all of the issues we've had, the students have really kind of risen to the challenge. And yeah, it's been a, a great year in that respect. All right, so Kevin, I'll let you um, give your opening remarks and then we'll jump into the presentations. Okay, great. Uh, well, welcome everybody, all the staff and the parents and of course the TESA students this year, all of our uh, T-Town board members and advisors and friends that have joined us. Um, I, it just gave me a moment to reflect, to think back uh, now that uh, you guys are the eighth uh, class of, of TESA and uh, made me think back about eight years ago, and Teton did in a strategic planning um, effort at that time. And you know there were several important pillars in that planning effort. One was to improve the, the stewardship of our preserve and to make a thoughtful um, um, blending of education programs and st uh, stewardship and science programs so that they were aligned with each other. Um, another one was recognizing that historically, a lot of our programs had served um, younger students, um, you know, grade school kids, so that we wanted to really begin to uh, speak more to young adults and adults. And I think Tess is a great example of how we've been able to do that. And we've only been able to do that because um, of, through, through, the, through the hard work of the team. And I wanna thank Mike, cause he was there from the beginning and uh, Danielle who's come on board and just been an incredible uh, source of inspiration and bringing her, all of her talents to it. Um, but most of all, Tessa is about the students. About It's about you guys having the experience to do a real science project, to go through the, the humbling and uh, sometimes difficult process of um, doing a science research project with a great um, and experienced mentor. Uh, mentorship is, is, uh, is huge in life on, on many levels. So I want to congratulate you guys for doing it and thank you for doing it during uh, what has been a very a challenging year and that, that forced us to really uh, reinvent things and do things in a, in a new way. So I'm, I'm excited uh, to see your work. So thank you all for, for, for uh, participating and uh, I guess on with the show. So the way this is going to work is each of us are going to introduce both myself and Dr. Rubo are going to introduce um, our students that we worked with, their presentation titles, and um, each student is going to have eight minutes for their presentation, and then we'll allow two minutes for questions at the end. Some students may be a little shorter on time, um, but we're gonna aim for less than eight minutes for everybody. If you have a question, please enter it into the chat box, um, and we'll ask that question at the end of the student's presentation. So, City, you're up first. Can you please share your screen? Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. 
So my uh, project was about eutrophication and I was examining the risk associated with using compost and chemical fertilizers. So eutrophication and harmful algal blooms, also known as HABs, are a pretty complicated issue for a number of reasons. First, they cause a lot of degradation and destruction to local aquatic ecosystems and aquatic ecosystems around the globe. They're usually caused by excess nutrients, specifically nitrate and phosphate. They cause injury to people on land and even animals because sometimes the allergy can get aerated by waves and that can cause harmful like respiratory issues to a number of people on land. So it also occurs in freshwater lakes, ponds, streams, oceans, literally anywhere there's water, eutrophication can happen. And one of the biggest issues with this is that there's multiple input sources that are difficult to control. So this is an example of numerous input sources. There's two types mainly, non-point, which are kind of like runoff from our agricultural areas, rural, uh, homes, suburban areas, and there's also point sources, which are usually pretty controllable because they're just a pipe leading into the water. My research focuses on this area where we're looking at agriculture and the use of fertilizers versus compost and to see if that actually leads to nutrient output. So formally, my research question is, is organic compost an effective alternative to nitrogen fertilizers in combating eutrophication following a simulated rain event? And my hypothesis is, if organic compost is an effective alternative to nitrogen fertilizers, I will measure less nutrient output for the leachate and runoff. So in terms of study design, I had three pots, or I was testing three things, control, fertilizers, and compost. And I created, I was, the control group had bare loam soil, the fertilizer had nitrogen fertilizer mixing with the water, which was going through with the rain event. And the compost had the compost mixed in with the soil in, in addition to a half inch covering on the top to make sure that the water went through compost. So I duplicated each of these four times. And in the first group, I left empty. Second group, I put leaf litter on top, which is kind of just like dead leaves, similar to what you would find in, on the ground in fall. And in the third group, I put um, seedlings and I used uh, maple seedlings, like just baby trees. And then in the fourth group, I put a normal covering of grass, similar to what you would find on any lawn. So I repeated all of these three times. And in terms of how I collected my data, uh, for each of the pots, I would simulate a rain event. For control, I used 150 milliliters of distilled water. For the fertilizer, the water was mixed with fertilizer, but I also used 150 milliliters. And the compost ended up using or absorbing a lot more of the water, so I ended up doubling that to 300 milliliters. But this is all corrected for in the data. At the bottom of the pots, I had a hole which collected all the runoff and leachate. And then I put it into a colorimeter. And from that, I was able to get my nitrate and phosphate outputs. So in terms of the data, uh, by fertilizer type, this is actually a split graph. These two are corresponding to the left y-axis and nitrogen fertilizers to the right. If I only used one axis, then compost and bare soil would barely even register. Um, but as you can see, this goes up to almost six and this one to one for nitrogen fertilizer. For nitrate, you get one and for phosphate, you get six. But over here, you're getting like 0 0.01, 0 0.02. So it's pretty much nothing compared to nitrogen fertilizer. Now, when we look at by substrate, you can see that there's not really that significant differences between whether I use leaf litter, turf grass, seedlings, or no covering. And in the end, uh, the impact of the substrate or what I put on top was not statistically significant. So the substrate will not change nutrient output that drastically, but the impact of fertilizer was statistically significant because by using different fertilizers, compost or chemical, that will alter the nutrient output. So compost mirrors the results of the control pretty well, which means that compost is an effective alternative to chemical fertilizers. So in terms of implications, uh, 0.15 parts per million of phosphate is enough to trigger an algal bloom in bodies of water. And the fertilizer output was six parts per million, meaning that the use of a fertilizer can lead to like really bad algal blooms and huge algal blooms, which would devastate local uh, ecosystems. So while nitrate levels were higher than normal, they were still under the five parts per million threshold, which is um, which means that they wouldn't cause any eutrophication by just nitrate runoff, but the phosphate does. So in terms of sources of error, uh, in terms of consistency, my soil had different particles, rocks and sticks. In the future, I might sieve the soil to just get the just get the soil particles and make sure that I can control it that way. Also the plants were of different sizes and especially for the trees and uh, grass, there were different um, root ball sizes which could affect how, much, how many nutrients it absorbed compared to the others. 
uh, in measuring, it's just general measuring errors. And also, since we were working outside when we were doing our research, the light levels were shifting during the day, which could have, could have al also altered the results. So in terms of future directions, if I were to redo this experiment, I would plant the substrate a week in advance to let the roots take hold and make sure that each plant has enough roots to absorb nutrients. I would give compost and fertilizer treatments throughout the entire week, and then at the end of that week, do the simulated rain event and collect the leachate. That way it's more like what you would find in, uh, on a farm. And then I would also use better containers and a better setup to maximize the leachate and runoff. Maybe have multiple holes drilled in the bottom, maybe tilt the container. I did tilt it, but maybe tilt it more so that I could collect more runoff from the top. And then also trying different types of fertilizers. In this experiment, due to the scope of uh, TESA and the time limit, I was only able to test with one type of fertilizer, but maybe using different types, maybe phosphate fertilizers if those exist and those kind of things. And then maybe also testing with different substrates, such as tomato plants or wheat or corn, typical to what you would find on a, uh, on a farm. So in terms of acknowledgements, I'd like to thank TESA for allowing me to use their facilities and equipment. And a special thank you to Dr. Begley Miller and Dr. Rubo for their guidance and insight into my experiment. Thank you, City. And I forgot to mention that City is a rising junior at the Wheatley School um, for his introduction. Does anybody have questions for him? No. Okay. Next up, we have to look at the agenda to make sure I'm right. Uh, yeah, Maggie Graysick. So, Maggie, you can share your screen. Hello. Um, how's that? Is this working? Yes, Maggie, yep. Okay. So, uh, I'm Maggie, I'm from Rye High School, and my presentation was on oysters and crabs comparing the eating habits of Panopeus sanguineus, or Hermographus sanguineus and Panopeus herbsti. So the Asian shore crabs or Hermographsis sanguineus are an Asian species, invasive species in America for, and have been for the past 30 years, which come from the South Pacific in Asia. They can have hundreds more babies than the native crabs and are opportunistic omnivores and can have more food sources than the native carnivorous crabs, so they have a significant advantage. So these are the, uh, all of the foods that the invasive crabs can eat, seaweed, salt marsh grasses, uh, soft-shelled crabs, mussels, and oysters. Whereas the mud crab, Panopeus herbsti, is a native carnivorous competitor and can only eat uh, the soft-shell mussels and oysters. So it doesn't have the same range of food. Additionally, the mud crab helps maintain the salt, salt marshes by eating snails. And the shore crab could overtake mud crab populations and add to the destruction of these habitats if they're left unchecked. Additionally, the eating habits of the Asian shore crab in relation to the oyster population has not been researched, which may be a factor in why the species has been so successful. And this could also be a detriment to the carnivorous crabs which rely on oysters, who don't have as wide a range of diet as the invasive Asian shore crab. So my research question was, does the invasive Asian shore crab, Hermographsis sanguineus, pose a greater threat to native juvenile eastern oysters, Crassotera virginica, by consuming more than the native mud crab, Panopeus herbsti? And my hypothesis, based on my lit review, was that if the Asian shore crab and native mud crab are both presented with native oysters, then the invasive shore crab will consume more. So my study design was, uh, I took male invasive Asian shore crabs and mud crabs from various sites town 10 to 30 feet off the shore of the North Fork of Long Island in these uh, highlighted areas. And I kept the crabs individually in buckets, which were given a 75% water change daily and rotated five oysters a day. Uh, every day I removed the previous day's eaten oysters and I used nine invasive shore crabs and 11 mud crabs. Additionally, 10 more buckets were used as a control, also with oysters exchanged and a 75% water change daily. And all of these buckets were kept in, uh, in my living room so that they were at a constant temperature. 
So in each crab bucket, I measured the oysters that were eaten per day, which you can see over here, they were smashed by the crabs. Uh, the crabs carapace widths and if they molted. And these are some of the pictures from the experiment. This is a mud crab eating a uh, oyster. Here's an Asian shore crab, and this was me collecting the uh, eaten oysters. So my results, I found that native mud crabs ate significantly more oysters than the invasive shore crabs with a p-value of 0 0.019. I also found that carapace width was not strongly correlated with oysters eaten for either species. So as an additional study, because the invasive Asian shore crabs ate less than the native mud crabs, I tried to observe if the crabs eating habits changed when they were in contact with each other. So I spent 15 minutes observing a single mud crab in a bucket, then a single Asian shore crab in a bucket, then two, uh, then an Asian shore crab and a mud crab in a bucket, and each bucket had five oysters in it. So I found that when the mud crabs were alone and together with the Asian shore crabs, their movements didn't really change that much. Whereas the Asian shore crabs moved a lot more when they were in a bucket with the mud crabs than when they were alone. Additionally, I found that the mud crabs would attack the Asian shore crabs a lot more than the Asian shore crabs would attack the mud crabs. So as a result, I found that it doesn't appear that the Asian invasive shore crab is an effective predator of the Eastern oysters. I also found that crab size is unrelated to how often crabs eat or how much they eat uh, of oysters. The mud crabs are quick to attack competitors in their territory and do so much more often than Asian shore crabs by my observations. And um, several, one thing that I observed a couple times was that the mud crabs would, the invasive shore crabs would take the oysters away from the mud crabs that had opened them, but I didn't observe it enough times to say that that is what they do. So it'd be interesting to look further into this to see if it's a common occurrence. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Rubo for helping me develop and improve this project, helping me analyze data, Dr. Be Danielle Begley-Miller for teaching, Dr. Tetralt from the Suffolk Project in Aquaculture Training for providing me with the oysters for this project, and my dad for helping me catch crabs, and my brother for helping me carry up buckets of water for water changes. Uh, thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions for Maggie? Because we had a bunch for Sidney after, when, once Maggie started. <laughs> So, should I answer the questions for me now? Yeah, you can, Cindy. So the questions were: What was the compost made of, or so was the compost made of kitchen scraps or another type of material? Okay, so. First, I do do composting at home, and we actually have like a big container in our backyard that we dump kitchen scraps out into. But my grandparents, or sorry, not my grandparents, my parents had just emptied it and spread it all around our lawn. So I ended up going to Hicks Nursery, which is in Long Island, and I just bought some like commercial compost that was organic. And then for the second question, which was how did he determine the amount of fertilizer and compost to use? Um, so fertilizer, they gave you on the box, they gave you like a mix, like I think it was like uh, seven ounces per like gallon that you have of water. So we just mixed it based on that. And the compost, I mixed a bunch in with the soil about one to one ratio. And then I put a half inch covering to make sure that the, the water went through compost and didn't miss all of it. Margarita to ask, remind us how to ask questions. So just type them in the chat box at the end or during the presentation and we'll, we'll um, call them out to each student at the end. And the chat, there's a little, little chat icon at the bottom of the screen. At the very bottom. It looks like a little um, talk bubble. So Maggie, you had a question about um, how long have the Asian shore crabs been present along the North Fork? So the Asian Shore crabs have actually been in the North Fork for about the last 30 or so years, and they were introduced probably in Belast water, uh, ships Belast, from going to New York City. Kevin, is your question for everyone so far, or is it specifically for Maggie? 
think that's from Kevin. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested actually in knowing that for both. I'm all, I always ask that question during Tessa because I Good question I'm curious. Cindy, why don't you go first? Why did you choose this question? Uh, so one of the things that like my parents and I have always done like is compost. Like since we got the big container in the back, like we've always been doing composting. And I was also curious if like conservation efforts were even working because I know a lot of people think just like assume that compost is better than all fertilizers. But no, I looked when I was doing the research, no one actually had tested the hypothesis. So I decided to do it myself. How about you, Maggie? Uh, I've always kind of just been vaguely interested in invasive species and uh, having being out here on Long Island and just having always heard about the Asian shore crab, uh, it was really interesting to look into it and see that we didn't actually know as much about it as I thought we might. So it was just very interesting to fill in that gap. All right. Thanks everybody for that. Um, next up is Vivian. So Vivian, do you want to share your screen? You are muted, Vivian, just so you know. Um, so hi, I'm Vivian Wong, and I'm a rising sophomore, and I go to Edgemont High School. Uh, so my project is Habitat Characteristics of Porcelain Berry Invasions at T-Town. Introduction. So the porcelain berry is an invasive species native to Asia and mainly parts of China, Japan, and Korea. Um, and it's in its native habitat, it's usually found in higher elevations and its natural limits are a few different species of insects and fungi. Um, the porcelain berry was brought over to the United States as an ornamental plant for its colorful berries. And here it's become invasive because it has no natural limits. And it's part of the wild grape family, which is why it looks very similar to wild grapes, which are native to this area. And the porcelain berry is harmful to native species because they shade them out. And that prevents native species from getting sunlight and nutrients, which they need to survive. Uh, they're also known to choke trees, uh, which makes the trees more susceptible to wind and storm damage. Uh, they're also a known host for bacterial leaf scorch, which is a harmful disease to native trees such as birch and oak. And this is uh, an example of trees being choked by the porcelain berry. As you can see, the porcelain berry vines have climbed over and on top of the trees, and you can see as a size comparison uh, with my mom and my sister, it has completely um, become invasive in this area. So my research question is, what habitat attributes do porcelain berry vine invasions have in Teton Lake Reservation? And my hypothesis was that if there's a porcelain berry infestation, then the area will have a neutral pH, high light intensity, dry moisture level, and less native species. And I predicted that there would be less native species because porcelain berries tend to be in disturbed areas. And I predicted that uh, the porcelain berry infestation area would have a neutral pH and dry moisture level because they're able to survive even in infertile, infertile soil. And lastly, I predicted that the area would be in a high light, high light intensity area uh, because they're often found in open spaces. So my TESA project uh, is an observational field study, and it's a direct comparison between adjacent patches with porcelain berry and without porcelain berry. And I went to five different locations around T-Town, and I was quantifying habitat characteristics such as soil and light. And this is a picture from Google Earth showing all my different plot locations. So four of them were around the nature center and the fifth one was at Cliffdale Farm, which is an area about a seven, seven minute drive from the nature center. So one of the things I tested for was soil pH using a pH meter, which measures a direct soil pH reading. 
And I also measured light intensity using a light meter, which measures photosynthetic active radiation in micromoles. And I took measurements every minute for four minutes at each plot. And then I averaged out those four measurements to get the final light intensity measurements. I also measured moisture. So first I took soil samples and sieved them. Then I measured their weight in grams and put them in the dehydrator for two days. And then I measured their weight in grams after drying and the difference in the weight before the dehydrator and after the dehydrator will show how much moisture there was in the original soil sample. And the last thing I tested for was native versus non-native vegetation. So I placed a one meter by one meter quadrat at each site and took a picture. Then I analyzed each picture on the computer and identified the different species using a plant identifier app. And then I drew three by three grids on each picture and then therefore from the grids calculate the percentage. And this is one of the examples of the plots I did. And this is the three by three grid I put on uh, the picture. So this is the data result for the soil pH. Um, nothing statistically significant in this. Um, both had a pH of around six. And this is the moisture level data results. There was again, nothing statistically significant. Uh, the porcelain on average was found to be in moderate moisture levels at around 10 grams. And this is the light intensity data result. Uh, nothing statistically significant again. And these three results make sense because the porcelain berry is able to survive in a variety of different habitats. And lastly, this is the result for the native versus non-native vegetation. And this was statistically significant. So um, in the bar graph, uh, blue represents native species and red represents non-native species. And when there's porcelain berry present, on average, uh, there was about 90% non-native species compared to 10% native species, while uh, when there was no porcelain berry present, there's about 55% native species and 25% non-native species. So this is a large difference between when there's porcelain berry present and when there wasn't porcelain berry present. Conclusions. So in the native versus non-native biodiversity, uh, when there's porcelain berry present, uh, then there was a lot more non-native species than native species. And when there wasn't porcelain berry present, uh, there was a lot more native species than non-native species. And for the light intensity, soil pH, and moisture levels, they were not statistically significant, which makes sense because the porcelain berry uh, is able to survive in a variety of different habitats. So some room for errors were for light intensity, that could have depended on the time of day that I uh, studied each plot. And I also only studied five locations. So if I studied more locations, that would decrease the margin of error. And also um, the different plots could have had different levels of disturbances, which could have affected the surrounding environment. So for future studies, I would study more locations and therefore increase sample size. Uh, I would also study other habitat characteristics of porcelain berry infested areas, uh, such as um, how fast uh, the porcelain berry vine can grow compared to native species in a certain amount of time. Um, also, how the porcelain berry interacts with other species, uh, such as in a recent study, uh, they have found that the porcelain berry attracts birds but repels mammals. And another study showed that uh, pollinators can actually benefit from the porcelain berry, but uh, Dirapsa moth larvae, when they feed on the porcelain berry instead of native plants, they are smaller and weaker uh, than if they fit on native plants. And I would also study uh, how the porcelain berry affects the nutrient content of soil, uh, such as worm castings. And lastly, I would study the medicinal properties of the porcelain berry, which is actually what they're used for in their nat native habitat. Uh, my acknowledgments to Dr. Begley Miller for mentoring me throughout the entire project and teaching me how to hike off trail. And to Dr. Rubo for helping me when Dr. Begley Miller wasn't available and for fixing the light meter for me. 
and to my fellow TESA students and my parents for supporting me and for transportation. Thank you, any questions? Does anybody have any questions for Vivian? I do, Vivian. I'll ask you a quick question. Um, when you had the vegetation in your plots, your meter square plots, and you found more invasive species, was that primarily porcelain berry or were there other invasive species growing with it? Um, it was uh, mostly porcelain berry, but I also did find some others such as Japanese stiltgrass and Japanese barberry. So there were other uh, non-native species that are invasive. Interesting. So two questions. Do any particular birds or animals consume porcelain berry? Um, it's mostly birds. Uh, other, the mammals mostly don't um, interact with the porcelain berry because they have some kind of toxic substance in them, which makes it hard for mammals to digest. But uh, the birds are able to digest it because of their uh, body system. And then another question, Vivian, what limits the plant in Asia in its native range? Uh, there's a few different species of insects and fungi which limit the porcelain berry. Uh, so it's not found as often there. Okay. And then why did you choose this for your research topic? Um, so I chose this as my research topic because I actually have porcelain berry vines in my backyard and it's been taking over our lawn. And also um, on the first day of TESA, when uh, Dr. Miller was talking about different threats to um, the T-Town Lake Reservation, she mentioned invasive species and about the porcelain berry. So that kind of just reminded me of my backyard and it made me want to do this as my project. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, Based on what you've done in your backyard, uh, would you want to eradicate the poison berry and how would you go about it? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I said based on the research you've done so far and the fact that you have this berry in your backyard, would you want to eradicate it and how would you go about that? Um, currently, there's no, um, nothing to eradicate the porcelain berry. It's just become invasive. Um, you can, we've been trimming it in our backyard, but currently there's nothing to eradicate it right now, uh, which is why there's been um, recent studies on, on the porcelain berry and to see if there are ways to eradicate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's hard to get out once it's established. You can hand pull the really small ones, but the big ones you have to cut back and keep cutting them back. Um, and sometimes you can exhaust them, but that takes a really long time. <laughs> so we've run into that here. All right, so next up is Emily. All right. Let me just share a screen. Okay, so this is my presentation, Soil Degradation on T-Town Hiking Trails. Uh, I'm Emily Holm, I'm a rising senior at Hamilton Central School. So a little bit of an introduction to what I'm studying. Uh, so soil degradation is a pretty big problem for a lot of natural parks with high use hiking trails. So what I found in the literature that I was studying is that the degradation of soil can lead to rapid erosion, it can lead to an increased runoff and or standing water if there's nowhere for the water to run off, um, and the trails can become muddier or rockier and just generally harder to walk on, which makes it a lot less fun and enjoyable to, you know, hike on if you're uh, hiking on a severely eroded trail. So, uh, according to research, type of use and level of use both have an impact on the soil below the trail and around the trail, and these effects can be felt 
10 feet away from the trail based on type of use and level of use. Um, so information on the soil characteristics of trails can provide management at T-Town ways in which in a time of hiking trail, like high hiking trail usage due to COVID-19 and the lack of other forms of uh, entertainment and exercise. So these are some examples of soil degradation and trail environments similar to T-Town. So you can see that there are these big exposed rocks here, and you can see that where the natural soil was before is all the way up here. So gradually over time, the soil has become degraded and it's become worn down by like hundreds and potentially thousands of hikers hiking on it till it looks like this with these big exposed rocks. Um, and you can also get where it's like a big mudded puddle where the soil has become too compacted for water to easily seep down. So you get these big puddles of water on the of just standing water on the trail with nowhere to go. And so that can also make things a lot harder to walk on. Hey, Emily, can you hear me? So my uh, central question for this was, how does the presence of hiking trails influence soil compaction? composition and plant density at T-Town Lake Reservation. My hypothesis was that the presence of hiking trails will cause an increase in soil compaction, a loss in soil moisture and nutrients, an increase in pH, and a decrease in plant density, both on the trail and in the immediate surrounding area, and that high-use hiking trails would experience the most pronounced effects of this, and low-use trails would experience the least effects of this when compared with the control, which was undeveloped. So my study design was an observational study design. Uh, my explanatory or independent variables were the amount of trail use, which differed between high use trails and low use trails. Uh, my response or dependent variables were three, were the three major factors in soil composition, which are the physical factors, the chemical factors, and the biological factors. And the physical factors are soil compaction, so how much of the soil compressed down, how dense is it, and the percent moisture, which is a pretty good indication of how healthy a living environment is the soil. So chemical factors, soil pH, some plants like a higher or lower pH. Um, and now there was some evidence to suggest in literature that uh, uh, hiking trail use would have an effect on soil pH. Um, nitrate levels and phosphate levels, uh, both of which are two uh, key nutrients that are responsible for plant growth. Uh, and the biological factors are the plant density, which again, just shows you like how healthy is the living environment on this trail. So there were two study groups in this study. There was a high use group and a low use group at both of those were conducted at Teton Lake Reservation. And each of those groups had four replicates. So there were four randomly chosen locations on high use trails and there were four randomly chosen locations on low use trails. So each study site was a one meter long by one meter wide section of trail and the general surrounding area of the trail. So on each section of trail, a transect line was drawn across the trail perpendicular to it. Um, and from there, uh, three sets of tests were performed per site. So both off trail tests were on the downslope side of the trail, which if you're building a trail cut into a hill, it's uh, this bottom part um, in order to more adequately examine the effects of erosion and trail runoff, because obviously water is going to flow down. So soil samples were connected from each site. Um, so three sets of tests, the three sets of tests, one of them was one meter away from the trail, one of them was uh, five meters away from the trail, and one of them was right on the center of the trail. And um, each of these sort of sites per um, section of trail that I used for the study um, was sort of a one meter by one meter quadrat, which is what I used to analyze plant density. So uh, soil samples were collected from each site and plant density and soil compaction were measured. So the soil for um, the nutrient tests was allowed to settle for 48, was dried and allowed to settle for 48 hours. It was first dried in open air for 24 hours, and then um, a solution was made using um, 10 grams of the soil, and that soil was allowed to settle out of the solution, and then we used that soil 
sampling solution to perform nutrient tests. And these tests were measured using a chemical color kit. Uh, the soil was weighed before and after 48 hour drying periods in a drying oven um, to calculate the percent moisture and soil pH was measured using a handheld pH reader. So my results were that uh, this is plant density by type of use and distance from trail. Um, because we are studying in so many different environments at T-Town and because of the like vast number of different sort of ecosystems that you can get at T-Town, there was um, a, ha a very high error bars with this because we were looking at so many different sites. Um, you can't really see a pattern here, um, and I can get into that a little bit later. Uh, so soil pH, by type of use and distance from trail, you can see that it's pretty uniformly lower with the low use trails. And again, there's a reason that I suspect that. And you might be thinking that's kind of counterintuitive, that why would the use necessarily have an impact on soil pH, but there's a reason that I think that's the cause. Um, so those all look to be fairly uniform error bars. Uh, so a compaction by type of use and distance from trail. Uh, this one had a very high, um, the uh, one centered on the trail had a very high um, error for that because I was, um, because the uh, low use trails happened to uh, vary pretty wildly in, um, how dense they were, whereas the um, ones for the high use trail did not vary much at all. They were all pretty uniformly hard and compacted. And soil moisture, uh, you can see that it um, increases uh, both. Um, it increases both with type of use, and um, it increases with um, distance from trail as well. So discussion. So nitrate levels were consistently high across all the tests. Um, no observed dis difference was recorded between phosphate levels at different points on and off trails. Um, so the nitrate levels being consistently high and the phosphate levels were also pretty consistently high. This means that like even on some of the high, higher use trails that there's still a good thriving living environment there and it's not completely degraded enough so to where that trail soil cannot support life. So there was a significant difference at the P equals 0 0.5 level between soil compaction on and off the trail, but there was no significant difference between high and low use trails. Uh, there was a significant difference in pH between high and low use trails, but no such difference between on and off trail. So um, this is, most likely because um, low use trails tended to be built um, further away from water and all of the low use trails that I took samples from were not close to water and so the water the pH um, uh, so the pH closer to water might have had an effect on that so soil percent moisture differs with both trail use and distance. So this is sort of makes sense where, you know, there's going to be a lower soil percent moisture on the trail versus off the trail. Um, plant density does, um, and the reason that it was overall higher for the high use is because a lot of the high use trails were built right on lakes. And so the, the water from the lake had a chance to seep into the ground, especially like one meter out, five meters out from the trail. So plant de density differs with trail use, but no such significance was found for distance. So this is likely due to, again, trail location, where these um, low use trails are being placed. Um, and these tended to be closer to areas of deer overbrowsing, the effects of which are clearly evident at T-Town. And there's just generally these areas where deer have come through and grazed everything out. And those just happen to be the ones where a lot of these low use trails are being built. So further directions for my research. So there could be um, more testing that needs to be done um, uh, to be done to determine the effect that trail location has as a confounding factor on soil characteristics. Um, trail sections observed in the study were 
only a small proportion of the 15 miles of trails at Teton Cliffdale, and that is just one of the parks in that region that all have similar general ecosystems. Um, so human error in soil penetrometry measurement could have contributed to readings that are not representative of the actual soil quality that we were um, observing on trails. So uh, the soil penetrometer that we used um, only went up to a certain level of force before it would just stop measuring. And um, it was, the soil was too compacted. Um, I'd like to thank Teton Lake Reservation, uh, Dr. Mike Rubo, Dr. Danielle Begley Miller, and my grandparents, Jane and Walt Daniels, for their support in my project. And does anyone have any questions? Any questions for Emily? I have a question. Okay. Uh, after many years of walking the Lakeside Trail at Teton, my wife and I have discovered a significant exposure of uh, tree roots across the trail, which has that... created major concerns for as we get older and it becomes more dangerous. Have you done anything at all in determining what the characteristics of those roots are? Why are they there and why can they, can they be controlled? Um, so... I don't necessarily know about controlling the tree root. I mean, plants need tree roots, and they just happen to get exposed as soil degrades and as erosion happens, and as people's feet begin to like brush away the dirt over like hundreds of people like walking these trails. And so, same thing with like large rocks that are underneath, the roots are also getting exposed, and that can sometimes be a problem for trees who need water and nutrients that they get from the roots to continue to grow. So that could also be a problem for the trees that are there. Is that a maintenance problem rather than an erosion problem? Um, I mean, sometimes there's a lot of, uh, like, sometimes maintenance and, like, putting in human-made structures, uh, such as... Um, the bridges and sort of uh, things over muddy patches can do a lot to help prevent tree er erosion, but prevent soil degradation and erosion. Um, but yeah, sometimes if there's trees, roots that are blocking the path, I'm not sure what you're getting at, but like if there's roots that are blocking the path, then people are going to come ha have to come clear those out to make it easier for people to walk on, but then you've just kind of destroyed one of the sources of nutrients for the trees. George, I can answer it more succinctly than that even. So the issue is that where the trail is located, that when the tree roots get exposed, that's explicitly due to erosion. Those tree roots were not exposed before the trail was there. And as the trail erodes over time, those roots get more exposed. And if we actually were to remove some of those obstacles, it even further uh, destabilizes the trail bed. So it's a mix between what can we actually remove that's safe for to keeping the trail in place versus what is safe for hikers, right? It's kind of a, a mix. So we try to remove what is an immediate trip hazard, um, but the trail structure, like Emily said, building some platform makes it easier um, on the trail and reduces the amount of erosion over time. All right, so next up we have, uh, lastly, uh, or no, actually we have two left. We're a little bit behind schedule, um, is Sarah. And so she's gonna share her screen. Hi, my name is Tree. Should I go down and see if we have any mail? Hang on a second, Sarah, let me... Um... It's going to be hours. All right, go ahead. Hi, my name is Sarah Mishra. I'm a rising junior, and my project was on quantifying the variability in individual ash tree characteristics to indicate the level of emerald ash borer infestation. So the emerald ash borer is an invasive insect that came over from China in the 1990s. 
Um, it started its spread in southeast Michigan and it spread outwards throughout North America. Ash trees have been dying for years across the continent, particularly um, the species of white ash, green ash, and black ash. The problem here is that it can throw off the balance of forest ecosystems when so many of these trees are dying because the open canopy can cause plant invasions and it provides less space for nesting habitats for birds. The North American ash species are so vulnerable because they can't recognize the larval cues from the emerald ash borer until it's too late and they're already dying or dead. So my research question was, does the health rating of an individual ash tree correlate with the level of infestation? And my hypothesis was that the ash trees would display characteristics that directly indicate the level of emerald ash borer infestation. So my study was observational. Um, the independent variable was the characteristics of the tree and the dependent variable was the level of infestation. Uh, I chose three field sites. One was at the intersection between the orange and the blue trail, one between the blue and the white trail, and one between the orange and the red trail. And I took data for 18 trees in total. I was able to first identify the ash trees by their jagged diagonal diamond bark pattern. And I spent a lot of time walking the trails and finding trees. Um, the predictor variables I collected were the health rating, which I used a one to five class scale, which I'll show you next. I also um, collected if they were alive or dead, and I collected the diameter at breast height, or the DBH. The response variables I collected were the average number of emerald ash borer exit holes per tree, and I also looked at the presence of larval channels for dead trees only. You can see in the picture for an example of what larval channels look like. And the data I measured for reference was the latitude and longitude of the area. I took um, the amount of exit holes for each section. I had five sections on the tree and um, from zero feet to one feet, one feet to two feet and so on. And I would count the amount of exit holes and then average them out per tree. And I also looked at if the tree was fallen over or if it was blonding, which means that um, the bark would fall off revealing the internal blonde exterior, interior of the tree. So this is the health scale I used. Class one would be where there are no decline symptoms and less than 15% transparency. And the class five would be if the tree was dying or dead and it was over 75% defoliated. And in the picture, you can see an example of each of the classes. So I only collected um, health ratings of three to five because most of the trees were already in bad condition. First, I compared the average number of exit holes versus the scale number, the health rating. And you could see that um, for the health rating of three, the average amount of exit holes was about five. And for the health rating of five, the average amount of um, exit holes was about 22. So there was a significant difference there. I also looked at the average number of exit holes versus if the tree was living or not. And um, if the tree was dead, the amount of exit holes was about 22. And if it was living, then it would be about six. So there was also a significant difference there. I also looked at the average number of exit holes and the diameter at breast height, but there was a very insignificant correlation, so I didn't really count that as being significant. So the health rating and if the tree was living or not were both correlated with the number of emerald ash borer exit holes, um, but the DBH did not correlate, which meant that the emerald ash borer does not have a size preference for when it feeds but I was thinking that maybe the emerald ash borer could prefer a certain location over another. Um, and I think it would be interesting to look into that in the future, whether it prefers um, feeding on trees near water versus not, or if the tree is more exposed to sunlight or not. Um, all the ash trees had a presence of exit holes and all the dead ash trees had an overwhelming presence of larval channels. And all the ash trees were classified as health ratings of three to five, so they were all in very bad condition. So in conclusion, ash trees at T-Town can display features that indicate the level of emerald ash borer infestation. And I think this information can help to characterize and manage the ash trees at T-Town in the future. Um, and certain organizations are using Manchurian ash, which is an ash species native to China, to develop a resistance method for the North American ash trees 
because the Manchurian ash are stronger in battling the emerald ash borer since they have um, been dealing with the emerald ash borer for longer. Um, and I would like to thank my parents for providing rides to T-Town and for supporting me throughout the program. I would like to thank Dr. Rubo for instructing me, and I would like to thank Dr. Beckley Miller for helping me develop the project and guiding me through the program. Are there any questions? Does anybody have questions for Sarah? I'll go. Sarah, I had a quick question. You had, I, I noticed that you had measured um, exit holes at different heights, but I didn't see any data presented. Is that because there was no pattern or you just didn't look at that yet? Um, I didn't put out that much because it would be a lot of data to present and yeah. explain. So I just averaged it out because I thought it would be better to analyze it that way. Did you notice anything like the height from the tree? Like yeah, actually, um, there would be more exit holes towards the bottom, like the zero feet to one feet section, okay. than up towards the four feet to five feet. Oh, that's interesting. Cool. We have a question. Is there a dilemma inherent in planting a different non-native ash, even if it's more resistant? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. Is there a dilemma inherent in planting a different non-native ash, even if it's more resistant? Um, I think it could be more helpful because um, if you plant the two trees towards or near each other, um, I think it would help because emerald ash borer would be less likely to um, infest on that site if there were more Manchurian ash with the North American ash species. Susie, a lot of these organizations are also trying to breed in the genetics of the resistance and keep a lot of the characteristics of the native ash to breed in resistance so our species are more native. Um, it's the same thing they're trying to do with chestnut, but obviously that happened, you know, decades ago and they're still working on that. So um, resistant ash is a long ways away. Uh, yeah, also it's what's being done with elms too. So we have a lot of pests that have come over and destroyed our native trees. Um, so lots of organizations are working on ways to restore those. Um, but it's, you know, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, right? So the, the keeping these things from getting here in the first place is, is helpful. All right, so last up we have Adalia. We're about five minutes over time, so we'll try to wrap up here and then we'll take a break. All righty, um, I'll share my screen now. Okay, can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Dolly Borton. I am from Yonkers Partners in Education, and I'll be presenting, is COVID-19 increasing pollution in natural areas? Introduction. So the generation of organic and inorganic waste by human activities is a direct cause of environmental degradation. And environmental degradation is caused by soil erosion, deforestation, air, and water pollution. Countries like the US stopped recycling programs in some of their cities because of the fear of COVID-19 spreading. And quarantine policies in most countries have led people to shop online with home delivery. For example, in New York, you couldn't be in a restaurant and you can't be in malls to shop. In the US, there has been an increase in garbage from personal protective equipment, such as masks and gloves. Also, Westchester County was severely impacted by the pandemic with more than 30,000 cases. This research is important because although it is known that there's been an increase in waste, it isn't known how areas with high, medium, and low rates of COVID-19 have been impacted by pollution. And this is also a bit unique because past research on COVID-19 has been based um, in cities, whereas this is based in um, natural areas such as trails and parks. Research question and hypothesis. The research question was, how has COVID-19 impacted the amount of pollution in areas with varying rates of the pandemic? The hypothesis was areas with high rates of COVID-19 will have more pollution than areas with low rates of COVID-19 and vice versa. The study design. So this study design was an observational study and the main focus was to look for face masks, rubber gloves, and hand sanitizers as, and hand sanitizer bottles as this is related to COVID-19. 
And I also had to look for other sources of pollution as well, for example, glass and plastic. The variables. The independent variable was the rate of COVID-19, and a dependent variable was the amount of pollution. Here's the study design continued. So there were field sites, and the, these sites were near lakes and streams with low, medium, and high rates of COVID-19. One of the places that I had gone to was Harrison, and the park I went to was Silver Lake Preserve and Pasadomo Veterans Memorial Park. I also went to White Plains, and um, I went to Liberty Park. In my Maranek town, I had gone to Sheldrick Environmental Center, Premium River Conservation Area Complex, Harbor Island Park. Finally, I went to Peekskill. I went to Peekskill Dog Park, DPU Park, and Charles Point Park. As you can see on the map, Harrison is labeled and also White Plains, as you can see, and these were um, had high rates of COVID-19. You can see Mamaronek Town is circled as well, and this had a medium rate of COVID-19. And finally, Peekskill had a low rate of COVID-19. And these rates were found by dividing the infection rate per municipality by the population de density of each municipality. Methods. So first I visited nine sites in Harrison, Peekskill, White Plains, and Mamaronek Town. Then at each I measured out 100 feet along a trail or area that was near a lake or a stream. Then I filled out a data collection sheet and assessed the type of pollution, for example, biodegradable, glass, or plastic gloves. And then finally, I filled out the rapid trash assessment observance sheets. On these figures, or figures one through three, are examples of trash. This, this first picture is an example of the type of plastic that was encountered. It's a wrapper from Peekskill Talk Park. The second picture is my aunt helping me measure out 100 feet at Silver Lake Preserve. Then finally, this is another type of, pol of pollution, but this was a hazardous pollution that was encountered at Pasadomo Veterans Park. As you can tell, it is a battery. This is the rapid trash assessment scoring, and the rapid trash assessment includes a visual sur survey, which is this, of, water, of the water body and areas around it from which trash can be carried to the water body by wind, water, gravity, or human activity. It represents the range of effects that trash has on physical, biological, and chemical integrity of water bodies or land. In this case, it is land. So the rating system it includes scores from zero to three, zero being the poorest score and optimal being three. So one of the things you would have to look at first is level of trash, in which I would which is based on what you see at first glance. The optimal score is three and includes no visible trash, while the poorest includes trash that distracts the eye. Next, you'd have to look at trash that is a threat to aquatic life and trash that is a threat to human life. And what you would look for mainly are toxic items or to toxic chemicals. For example, um, if you would see uh, batteries or feces or cigarette butts. And finally, you would look at trash that was dumped. And these items were brought behind or left behind. And for the optimal score of three, there would be five items or less of litter that was carried downstream or from another location. And then poor, which is a, zero, a score of zero, which includes a significant litter on the shore or in the water. This is figure four, which is litter type by COVID class. And as you can see, we collected many types of litter, such as biodegradables, cigarettes, fabric and cloth, glass, metal, and plastic. In the biodegradable category, the areas with low rates of COVID-19 had the most. In the cigarette category, areas with high rates of COVID-19 had the most. In the fabric and cloth category, there was no statistical difference. In areas with low rates of COVID-19, there was more plastic. And surprisingly, areas with medium rates of COVID-19 had the most total litter. This is figure five, COVID-associated litter by COVID class. In this figure, the COVID-associated litter included rubber gloves and face masks. We didn't include hand sanitizer bottles because we didn't find any. As you can see, the average number of face masks were equal overall. And the average of rubber gloves was higher in areas with low rates of COVID-19. This is figure six, the rapid trash assessment or RTA score. And the total RTA score shows that my, hypo my hypothesis wasn't statistically valid. 
as you can see, it is mainly the same throughout low, medium, and high rates of COVID-19. Conclusion. There was no significant difference that was noted in the amount of pollution with the municipalities with high, medium, and low rates of COVID-19. The limitations of research included the limited time frame. It took a week. For future research, maybe there could be a longer time frame, about a month or more, and more participants to count trash, more than four per area, to get more ground. And also, maybe in the future, it could also focus on parking lots because people are more likely to be there, especially wearing more personal protective equipment there. Why these results may have occurred? So these results may have occurred due to the public properly disposing personal protective equipment. The sites could have been too similar. For example, the population rate in the towns were in, was in the low 20,000s range. If it had been maybe the higher 20,000s range, maybe it could have been different. And the socioeconomic background of the towns could be a factor in the amount of pollution that was found. The more funding for parks, the cleaner it is. And as you can see, Peekskill's home value index is $346,381. Harrison and White Plains has $600,281. And the Mamaroneck Town has $792,035. And also, maybe people aren't wearing personal protective equipment outside in these areas because they're more likely to wear them indoors because of the aerosol um, that could come out of people's mouths and the bacteria could just spread that way. And they're more likely to wear them inside because they'd like to protect themselves more. And there's more expo exposure indoors than outdoors. I'd like to thank Tessa, Dr. Rubo, Dr. Begley Miller, Mr. Jacob Schofield, and my family for driving me around. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box below. Thanks, Adelia. You have a question. Did you see signage posted at various sites? If so, did you notice an impact? I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, it's okay. Did you see signage posted at the various sites regarding the PPE disposal or trash disposal? And if so, did you notice an impact of the signage? I didn't see any signs actually in any of these parks. I didn't see anything. And why did you choose this particular project? Well, I chose this project because I live in Yonkers and um, before, like during the, um, when we first closed down, I noticed that there were a lot more masks outdoors on the floor and also rubber gloves in general. But then over time, I noticed um, that there were less masks. So I just thought that maybe other places were impacted more. I just wanted to see how these places were impacted. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for listening in on the first session.